The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries, celebrating 40 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Today, Andrew illustrates the power of God's Word to change our lives in his teaching, Spirit, Soul, and Body. Now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm starting my third week of teaching on spirit, soul, and body. And this is just my favorite thing in the world to teach, or I guess in the Lord to teach. I tell you, this has changed my life. I am so excited about it. And I really believe that the people who've been watching this program are being transformed all around the world. You know, I had a number of people come up to me in just the last few days and start trying to tell me how that the programs had changed their life, and they just broke down and started crying. They didn't know how to express it. And, um, you know, and I understand. I know how this has changed my life. It would be impossible for me to just communicate verbally. And as a matter of fact, that's what I'm doing. It's, it's frustrating in a sense to try and to tell you what, how powerful this teaching has been in my life and what it's done for me. And I'm saying all these things to encourage you. Those of you who haven't yet got this revelation, that you still are struggling with some of these things we're talking about, I'm encouraging you. It's worth the effort to get these materials, to go back over them and to listen to it because this is a life-changing teaching. And we now have this brand new study guide, which is a great addition to all of our teaching on spirit, soul, and body. It'll help you. Uh, to get this, and also it was designed primarily to help you teach this to other people, either in a Sunday school setting or in a Bible school setting, and uh, it would be a real blessing to you, so please take advantage of those things. I've been teaching for the last week about how that when you get born again, your spirit completely changes, and according to Ephesians 4.24, it was created in righteousness and true holiness. 1 John 4, 17, as Jesus is, so are you in this world. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, identical in spirit to Jesus. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. If, uh, Romans 8 and 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You have Jesus living inside of you, and your born-again spirit is identical to him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that your born-again spirit cannot sin. It is holy and pure. And then I started teaching on Thursday of last week that Ephesians 1, 13 says, once you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That that holiness and purity that all of those verses I was quoting talk about, that instant purity that you had when all sins were forgiven, at that exact moment you were sealed, vacuum-packed with the Holy Spirit. And if you sin as a Christian, that sin penetrates into your physical body and gives Satan against you in the physical realm. It'll penetrate to your soulish realm, into your emotions and into your mind, and it'll cause depression and confusion and anger and all of those kind of things, but it does not break the seal. It can't penetrate the seal of the Holy Spirit around your spirit, and therefore, in the spirit realm, you stay righteous and holy, even though you go out and fail and sin in your physical body. And since God is a spirit, John 4, 24, and he, we must worship Him in spirit and in truth, that means that God is able to love you and to fellowship with you and to bless you and to do all of these things, have relationship with God even though you aren't perfect in your physical body. I don't say that to encourage you to go live in sin, but I say that to those of you who are trying with everything you've got to live for God and you are just human and you fall short and you aren't perfect, which includes every person breathing. You know what? This will break the guilt and condemnation. You'll be able to approach God in spirit and in truth. And I started using last Friday Hebrews chapter 9 and uh, verse 12 and verse 15 where it talks about that through one offering we obtained eternal redemption, which is talking about the forgiveness of your sins. You don't lose this right standing with God that we gain through Jesus every time you sin and have to go back and get back into fellowship with God. 
but in the Spirit you have eternal redemption. Verse 15, Hebrews 9, 15, you have eternal inheritance. And again, if you were to take all of this in its context, which I don't have time to go back and read all of these verses, but if you were to read the book of Hebrews, it is written to Jewish believers to help them transition from the Hebrew, the Old Testament way of serving God, into the New Testament way. And there's many contrasts between the Old Testament uh, way of approaching God in the New Testament, and one of them is that in the Old Testament, every time a person sinned, there had to be a new sacrifice for sin. There had to be this day of atonement on a yearly basis, and there was just constant animal sacrifices to atone for sin. But in the New Testament, only one sacrifice for sins dealt with you forever. Past, present, and even future sins have been forgiven. That's the point that's being made, and he uses this about five times here in the ninth chapter, contrasting the way it was done under the Old Covenant with the way that it was done under the New Testament. Let me drop down to Hebrews chapter 9, and in verse 23 it says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, talking about animal sacrifices, blood of animals, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He's saying that the tabernacle and the Old Testament temple were symbolic of things that really existed in heaven, and so they were cleansed and purged symbolically. But the real things, the real temple, the real mercy seat, the real holy of holies that exist in heaven had to be purified with more important things than just the blood of animals. And, of course, it was the blood of Jesus that purified them. And in verse 25, it says, uh, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Well, can you see what he's saying right here? He's saying it's not the way it was. In the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices every morning, every night. There was people that brought sacrifices to atone for individual sins. And then there was a day of atonement where they went in once a year and dealt with all of the sins that were unconfessed, all of the sins that they weren't even aware of. You just had this constant flowing of blood constantly all of the time. There was atonements being made. And he says, but it's not like that in the New Testament. He doesn't have to offer himself often as the high priest in the Old Testament did, entering in, you know, with the blood of others. Because then, if that's the way that it was, Jesus would have had to have offered himself often since the foundation of the world. But once, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment... So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him that shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Again, if you were to go back and study this in its context, the contrast is just undeniable. In the Old Testament, they had to offer a sacrifice. They had to ask forgiveness every time they sinned. In the New Testament, one sacrifice for sins for all time sanctified us, and put us into right standing with God. That is just some kind of powerful. And then in chapter 10, remember that men are the ones that broke this letter into chapter and verse divisions for the purpose of reference. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not a new thought. It's continuing on. It's the very next sentence. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? As a proof that these Old Testament sacrifices never made anything perfect, they kept offering them. If it would have perfected the people, they'd have quit offering them. That's what he's saying. Well, the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't make anything perfect, and so they had to keep being offered. But now we have a New Testament sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus paid for all of our sins. Past, present, and even future sins are paid for. And because of it, one sacrifice for all sins, for all times, has forever perfected us. Sin has been obliterated. God is not dealing with you based on your sins. 
This does not mean that you're free to go live in sin because, it, first of all, if you're truly born again, you want to be free from sin, not free to go live in sin. And secondly, if you go live in sin, you are opening up a door to the devil and Satan's going to eat your lunch and pop the bag. You don't want to do that. But God has dealt with all of your sin. So in verse 2 again, he says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. You know that we have been once purged through Jesus. That's the context of all of this. And we should not be sin conscious. Our life and our relationship with God should not revolve around sin. And yet this was true with me one time, and I bet you it's true with a lot of you watching this program, that every time I came to God, it was all about, oh, God, I come before you so humbly. God, I'm just so sorry. I know I'm not the person that I should be. I know I've done this wrong. And then you'd start mentioning all this stuff, and you would just spend a huge amount of time talking about how sinful you were and asking God for forgiveness and telling him you're sorry, and, oh, God, help me to live better. This says that there should not even be any more conscience of sin. Boy, that's radical. That's radical. And not very many people understand this. Matter of fact, it scares a lot of people. They think if I wasn't conscious of sin, if I didn't go around bearing this mentality that I'm unworthy and just feeling like I'm just the scum of the earth, and if I wasn't upset with myself and constantly monitoring and holding myself in check, I'd just go out and live like the devil. You know, it's really just the opposite. If you've been born again, the spirit that's within you, 1 John 3, 9, cannot sin. It doesn't desire to sin. It's dead to sin, Romans chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. And if you would focus on that and relate to God and just instead of thinking about all of your sins, think about what he's done and think about how good he is and think about all of the great things that he's done for you. You know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think I'm an old sinner saved by grace, well, then you believe at your core being that you're a sinner and you'll only resist temporarily or partially and after a while you'll give in because after all, that's who you really believe you are. But if you believe you've been born again and if you've become a new person and if you're focused on that, you know what? You'll wind up beginning to talk and act like a new person and you'll start getting set free from these actions of sins and you'll wind up living holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before through not having sin consciousness. That's absolutely true. You know, that's a whole other message, but that, that's a powerful truth. And this is saying that if there could have been a sacrifice which would have really forgiven sins, then they would have ceased to be offered because the worshipers would have had no more sin consciousness. Well, Jesus is a sacrifice who did deal with sins, and because of that, we should have no more sin consciousness. That's wonderful. Just imagine what it would be like to enter into the presence of God and just go to worshiping Him for how holy He is, how good He is, how good He's been to you, what He's done for you, and just worship Him without any mention of how sorry you are. Amen. Some of you can't even imagine that. You've never done it. But that's what it should be. I heard Kenneth Copeland one time, he says, if you feel like a gnat on the back of an elephant when you approach God, then instead of talking about how small you are, talk about how big he is in comparison to you. In other words, if you feel like you haven't done everything right, instead of focusing on all of your sin and your failures and talking about that, talk about how wonderful God is to provide this salvation that he can forgive you and and set you free from all sin, past, present, and even future sin. And praise Him for how good He is. Talk about the wonderful goodness of God instead of your sorriness. Boy, that's powerful. You know, for time's sake, I'm going to skip a number of these verses. They all fit perfectly. Man, it's just reinforcing this same thing, that Jesus has paid for all of your sins. You shouldn't have any more sin consciousness. But let's drop down to verse 10. This is Hebrews 10.10. 10. He says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
Now here again, the reason I'm using these verses is to show that we have eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, 12. You don't lose your right standing with God every time you sin. When you were born again, you were created righteous and truly holy and then sealed with the Holy Spirit. And God, that sin that you commit after you're born again doesn't penetrate that spirit. Therefore, God is able to look at you in your spirit and you're always righteous and holy and pure once you've been born again. God is not imputing sin unto you. He's not holding it against you. And so this verse says that by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, some people have said, well, that means once for all people, but not once for all time. You have to go back and every time you sin, get that sin under the blood and get reestablished in your relationship with God. If you read this in context, it's going to show you that it's talking about once for all time, not once for all people. So again, let's read this. Hebrews 10:10. 10, 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. See, the context shows you it's not just one sacrifice for all people, but no, it was one sacrifice for all people forever. Talking about length of time, that you don't have to go back and re Get, get saved over and over again, born again, again, again. You don't lose your right standing and then have to get back into right standing. When you got born again, you were given a spirit that was righteous and holy and pure. It was instantly sealed with the Holy Spirit and it retains that one sacrifice dealt with all of your sin for all time. That is just some kind of powerful. In verse 12, he sat down on the right hand of God, verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Boy, that's powerful. By one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who's sanctified? Verse 10 of this same chapter, just a few sentences prior to this says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus' sacrifice sanctified you. The word sanctified means to make holy or to set apart. And verse 14 says, if you have been sanctified, you have also been perfected forever. Now here again, see, is where you understand spirit, soul, and body. The scripture says this, that you've been sanctified, perfected, eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. People go to the mirror and they say, this is sanctified, this is perfect. And they see all kinds of imperfections. They see things that they don't like. And they say, how can this be perfect? The Bible is so hard to understand. But it's not your body that was perfected. And you could not, you know, stand in front of a mirror and tell that your body's not perfected yet. You could search your emotions and your thinking and say, well, I'm not perfect there yet. I still... And I know I'm not walking in the joy and in the victory and in the peace that I'm supposed to. But it's not talking about your body and soul. Over here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 and 23. Again, this is the same book. It was divided into chapters and verses to help us reference these things. But it's not a different thought. It's the exact same book. He just keeps saying this over and over and over. And over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, in the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Right there it tells you which part of you was sanctified and perfected forever. It's your spirit that has been made perfect. Your physical body isn't perfect. It's got to be changed. The scripture says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that this mortal must put on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruption. There is a terrestrial body talking about an earthly body and there is a heavenly body. We haven't got a heavenly body yet. This is still my physical earth suit that I'm walking around in. 
It has been purchased, and I am promised that someday I'm going to get a glorified body that will be able to zip from place to place. It will be able to go through walls as Jesus' glorified body was. It won't have the same limitations that this physical body has, but I don't have that glorified body yet. I've still got a physical body. I've been promised that I'm going to know all things as even also I'm known out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But right now, my mind is still partial. I only know in part. I only prophesy in part. So my body and my soul aren't perfect yet. But in my spirit, it has been sanctified and perfected forever. Man, I don't know if that helps you, but that, that would put a shout in a statue. That would make a corpse shout. Man, that's powerful. That's powerful. God has changed me in my spirit. I'm identical to the way that I'm going to be throughout all eternity. You know, so many people sing, when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. And it is going to be a great day because your body and your soul will finally catch up with your spirit. But right now, your spirit is as complete right now as it will ever be. And as much as you can renew your mind and change the way you think and quit dealing with things as a mere human being, if you could understand that you've been born again and in the spirit realm, you are identical to Jesus. You are sanctified and perfected forever. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit so that whatever failure or sin you do doesn't penetrate that seal and it doesn't corrupt or contaminate or take away any of the good that is in you in Christ. If you could understand that, man, I tell you what, this just would motivate you. If you really believe that you had this on the inside of you, and again, most people don't because they can't see it in a mirror and they can't feel it with their, one of their five senses. So if they can't see it, taste it, hear it, smell it, or feel it, most people don't believe it exists. But it does exist. This is what the Word is saying. And if you by faith could perceive this, it would change your whole outlook. You would quit dealing with things as a mere human being. You would start expecting God's supernatural results. You would start walking in healing and health and prosperity and joy and peace. It would just transform your life. I'm telling you that this is what's happened to me. This teaching is what has changed my life. And there's a million things that I've learned since then but this is kind of like the key that started all of these things, that opened up all of these doors. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is what you need. You need to understand what's happened to you in the Spirit, that you have been sanctified and perfected in your spirit. And that Holy Spirit has been sealed so that no impurity is ever going to change that. It doesn't lose its potency. You don't lose your right standing with God. Boy, God loves you because God sees you as you really are. God sees you better than you see yourself. You look on the outside, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks on the outside, outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God is seeing you in the Spirit, and if you've been truly born again, you are a new creature. You are absolutely sanctified and perfected forever. You have eternal redemption and eternal inheritance. And God sees you differently than you see yourself. You need to start agreeing with God. This is powerful. I really encourage you to get these materials. You need this teaching. I believe that. If I knew who you were, I'd send it to you. Amen. I need you to call or write and request these materials. Please take advantage of them. And then join me again tomorrow. I'm going to continue this teaching on eternal redemption on our Gospel Truth broadcast tomorrow. Andrew's four-part teaching titled Spirit, Soul, and Body is available in a CD album or it's available in a DVD album as seen on TV. Ask for T1027 and be sure to specify CD or DVD when you make a gift of 13 pounds or more. The second teaching in the audio CD album is also available for a donation of three pounds or more. We encourage everyone to send a gift but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this second CD free of charge. Request teaching TK92 when you write or call and we'll be pleased to send it to you. Spirit, Soul, and Body, the book, is also available when you send a gift to the work of this ministry. Request T318 when you write, call, or go to our website. 
For the very first time, this teaching is available in a companion study guide for a gift of £17.50 or more. Included is a CD-ROM that allows you to duplicate any resources needed for each lesson. Request study guide T418 when you contact the ministry. The very best way to reach us is through our website. You can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day at awme.net. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. Again, that's 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours extend from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If the lines are jammed, remember you can go to our website and there's no fee for reaching us through the internet. If you prefer to write us, our address is AWME, that's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today. I want to thank those of you who are partners with us and who give beyond just, you know, the amount of money that it takes to get the products, the materials that you get. But, you know, it's our partners that have made us so that we can be on television around the world sharing these truths. People's lives all the way around the world today have been impacted by these truths that I've talked about. And I just want to thank those of you who are partners. We have a number on your screen that you can call. There are different partnership levels. Uh, the uh, people at our phone center will give you more information. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Kampala, Uganda, July 11th and 12th. He'll also be in the Northwest Province of South Africa on July 20th and July 21st through the 23rd. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. I'd like to encourage you to go visit our website. We have that address on your screen, and I tell you, we have one of the most um, powerful websites of anything I've ever seen. I get comments about how user-friendly it is. I have hundreds of my teaching available for free downloads. And there's literally been people's lives saved by having all of this teaching material available to them free of charge. We have our living commentary there. I have about, I think it's eight years or more of our television programs that you can view right there on the website. We have about 10 or 11 years worth of my radio programs there. It's just a wealth of information, so please join us on our website. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more Gospel Truth. They didn't say, ask Jesus to come into your heart and forgive your sins. They didn't mention confessing your sins. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Believe what? Believe that Jesus has already come and borne your sins and believe and receive. That's tomorrow on Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack.